Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Today, we have a very special guest, Mark <laughs> Faber, the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Mark, it's great to see you again. Thank you very much for having me on your program. Uh, Dr. Faber, thank you very much. Uh, I want to start this off uh, with something I saw you say on a recent interview. Um, do you think we're losing our freedoms? Are you surprised that it's happened so fast? I've read about uh, you know numerous authors about capitalism, freedom, and democracy, and some have pointed out that the capitalistic system was going to be so successful that it would increase the envy among some people and that therefore inevitably you would have socialism that follows capitalism. That was one of the series of Schumpeter and he uh, was a rather intelligent observer of society and of economics, obviously. So I think uh, if you ask me this question, are you surprised by how fast it happened? No, in a way it didn't happen all that fast. It started, in my opinion, more than 20 years ago, when in their brilliance, the governments decided to ban smoking in restaurants and bars and everywhere. You know, given that in most countries, smokers still account for 20 to 30 percent, and in some countries, 50 percent, like Turkey or Indonesia, that you would close everything down uh, just uh, for the sake of some people. One could have approached the issue in such a way as to say, well, in restaurants, there's no smoking until 10 p.m., say, mm. you know, and after dinner, people can smoke if they want. Or we could let people smoke in some restaurants and not in others and let them smoke in some bars and not in others. So each owner of the bar, each visitor could choose. I go to this establishment because you can smoke and I don't like the smokers. So I go to that establishment and that is freedom, basically. Mm -hmm. Or when you look at 9-11, it happened in 2001. Uh, after that, traveling became far more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And whenever you had a problem because you had a nail clipper somewhere in your luggage, or well, I've been held up because I had small bottles, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, larger than that, small bottles for eye drops. They mm -hmm. searched the whole suitcase for, to find these eye drops and so forth. So you ask yourself, for what? Of course, they always say uh, or said, it is my duty. I'm only following orders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or they say, I do it for your own protection, for your own good, and for the protection of the old, old, old the aircraft. Yeah. It's always some kind of an excuse. But slowly, step by step, and I've read about the history of the Third Reich, and some commentators have explained exactly how it happened, step by step. Mm -hmm. And the famous... Uh, Priest, he wrote, uh, neither I forgot the name precisely, but anyway, he said, first they came after these people. I didn't belong to these people, so I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Then they went after these people. I didn't belong to these people, and so I didn't care. Mm -hmm. At the end, they went after me. And nobody was around to protect me anymore because they had all been <laughs> eliminated. Yeah, we have to. So yeah. I'm not that surprised. I'm not that surprised. But clearly, it is an infringement that into people's lives and people's freedom. That has never, ever happened before in history. Yeah. 
You understand? This is a new thing. So will the U.S. government today, will they reach a peak in the ability to stimulate the economy? Like how long can they keep it going? This is the question everybody is asking, uh, asking himself. Uh, and it's a very good question and very relevant. Today, I was watching a chart that was produced by Eddie Yardeni, Yardeni.com. He's a great economist and he produces very good charts. Uh, so I don't want to advertise it uh, for him, but it, it's the reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's the reality. He's a friend of mine. And the chart showed the yield on 10-year bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. The 10-year bond deals for the last few years has been below 2%. And the inflation in those days was, say, 2 3% or so. So it was mildly negative interest rates in real terms, inflation adjusted. But now, according to the government, the inflation is running at over 4% per annum. But these are government figures. Private sector figures show that your cost of living increases. Yours and yours are running <laughs> at somewhere between 5 and 10%. Yeah. Wow. You understand? Oh, yeah. Housing prices are up 18% in 12 months. Is it the same in Europe, like the US? Are housing prices going up like that there? In some areas, maybe, yeah. but maybe less, but similar. Mm -hmm. it, it, you see, the housing market is very fragmented. So you could have, say, property prices in states that are uh, ty ty tyrannized by the Democrats, like California or a city like San Francisco, there maybe property prices are going down, mm -hmm. except in the neighborhood of Nancy Pelosi, because she has private security. <laughs> so next to her house, it's probably quite safe to have a house. Uh, but the private security, I have to point out, is paid by taxpayers' money, not by herself, yeah. of course. That's always the case. People are very generous with paying out all kinds of things when they don't pay it themselves. And most government officials, they can spend money at infinitum because they don't pay the, their own money they take other people's money to essentially transfer money to other people mm -hmm. why do you think the people allow that dr faber again this is the social question that uh, is very relevant the people allow it so far, it's not going, going to continue forever because they don't pay, they don't feel it that they are paying for it. Mm. They sit at home and they get checks from the governments. 99% of the people who get uh, subsidies and support from the government. But the last thing they will ask themselves is where does the, the, the money come from? Mm -hmm. you get the picture yeah, they, they, just, don't, they, they don't understand they, the, they the, think the government is a huge accumulation of cash that can forever pay out people their pensions their salaries, their benefits and when the economy goes back they can pay their salaries in full yeah. mm -hmm. they never think about this Yeah, but they will think about it, and this relates to the question you just asked before. The big threat to asset prices and to the well-being of uh, individuals is when interest rates will go up, what happens? Mm -hmm. When people have to pay months by months higher mortgage rates, when people have to pay months by months higher 
rates on the credit cards and so forth. Then the question obviously will come up to people, why, what, what, what's happening? Then the government can do two things. They've done it before. They can initiate price controls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and usually these price controls have been a step towards a major disaster. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that I guarantee you. It's like lockdowns. Mm -hmm. Lockdowns are a major disaster because they've created shortages all over the place and the prices go up. You know, that, that raises a, an interesting point. Um, I wonder whether we've killed more people with the response to the pandemic than the actual virus did. I, I've seen statistics where for every 1% of unemployment that goes up, you kill, you know, X number of thousands of people die because of lower living standards or inability to take care of yourself. And I just wonder with, with all the crazy economic policies that the world has done, whether the, the cure was worse than the disease this time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I've just written about this because I'm a very uh, big skeptic of any intervention. An intervention usually doesn't work uh, as expected. And number two, it's very <laughs> dangerous to let people without any knowledge carry out the interventions. Yeah. So let me give you two or three uh, examples of what the lockdowns did. First of all, over the last 18 months, obesity among small children aged 5 to 12 has increased at twice the rate as it increased before. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes, this is a very significant statistic. And uh, the problem is that once a child is obese, it's very difficult to lose this obesity. Mm -hmm. They'll stay obese. And during the stage of obese, uh, being obese, uh, some sicknesses arise and are very dangerous. Number two, I never thought about this uh, until I read it. One of the consequences of the lockdown was that they closed the schools. They also closed down the kindergartens. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what happens, you uh, have a job and your wife has a job and one or two of your children, they go to kindergarten. Now they close down the kindergarten. What happens? One of you will have to stay home. Mm -hmm. The two kids, five and seven or four and six or whatever, they can't go anywhere. They have to stay home and you or your wife will have to stay home and look after them. Okay. Yeah. Now the lockdowns, what they've done is they bankrupted a lot of daycare centers. So when the reopening happens, there are far fewer daycare centers around. At the same time, the smart Democrats and bureaucrats with their eagerness to control everything mm -hmm. made it much more expensive to run a daycare center. And so the cost of the daycare center has gone up dramatically. Yeah. Now, daycare centers open up again, but your wife or you are, have given up the job. And now the question arises economically. Does it pay for you to go back to work in order to pay for the daycare center that costs now maybe 20% more than before? Mm -hmm. Or is it cheaper for you to stay home and look after the children? Gotcha. So according to experts who've analyzed the problems, about 5 million people 
will not go back to work because they have to look after the children. Yeah. You know, I want to turn, turn, I, I watched a recent interview with you where you said, uh, we were talking about the US dollar and you feel the US dollar is doomed and the Fed will never tighten again until World War III or some other calamitous uh, economic uh, reason. I personally, I'm right there with you. I agree. But, uh, you know, walk us, walk through for our audience why you think the Fed can't tighten and what that, what that other side afterwards may look like. How do we get there? Well, uh, this is the big question. Can they tighten or not? If the market was operating freely, then the 10 years treasury note, instead of yielding, what is it now, 1.6, 1.7%, would, yeah. would be yielding something like 5%. Yeah. Now, consider someone bought a house and is paying a mortgage rate of, say, 3% and suddenly it goes up to 6%. What does it do to him? Yeah, uh, he probably yeah. can't afford his more. Well, that's a variable mortgage. He couldn't afford the mortgage, but also I think overall people wouldn't be able to make this, the, the bids they're making. I mean, the value of housing would drop dramatically as yeah, the cost of, course, of money yes. increases, yeah. <laughs> the value of stocks, of bonds, of houses of collectibles, everything depends on interest rates. Yeah. They are high because interest rates are artificially low. Mm -hmm. And one day these interest rates will go up. Now, when they go up, the Fed has two opportunities uh, or two uh, options. They can essentially tighten in the hope that their tightening is slowing down the economy, that would then bring down interest rates again. Mm -hmm. But will they have the courage to tighten? They haven't had the courage up to now. And then there's a political element. Next year, we have elections, midterm elections, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think Powell and Yellen, who are you know, really super dove that they will tighten before the midterm elections. Yeah. And then two years later, <laughs> we have the presidential elections. Do you think that these two people, Yellen and Powell, would want to cause a recession right ahead of a major uh, election? Because 2021 will be an important election in terms of the Republicans getting back the House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe they, they can manage it. Maybe not. But then the 22, uh, uh, sorry, the, 20, uh, 20, the 24 elections will be important whether the Republicans come back in. Mm -hmm. I don't think Trump has a chance. But Santis, I think he would be a candidate that a lot of people would actually, even Democrats, vote for. Uh, just back to the question, is the dollar doomed? Uh, I want to get back to that aspect of... Yes, uh, in my opinion, yes. But you have to see one thing. The dollar was overvalued in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. grossly overvalued against European currencies at the time. <clears throat> but then the dollar stayed up until the US went off the gold standard in 71. Yeah. Similarly, gold and silver were grossly undervalued in the late 60s, but mm -hmm. they only started to move up strongly in uh, 1971 after the U.S. went off the gold of the gold window. I wouldn't rule out that the dollar actually strengthens here, because the increase in interest rates in the U.S. the bond market has been weak. The increase in interest rates 
may support the dollar for a while. Mm -hmm. But I now I don't travel anymore, but I can see the price level in the US compared to other countries very high. In this environment right now, are you surprised gold, you know, with all the, it seems like the perfect storm for gold and silver uh, with all the macro environments and everything going on. Are you surprised gold's not 3000? Are you surprised silver's not already 50? Are you surprised they're not behaving as people would expect traditionally? Well, let's put it this way. It's difficult to surprise me because I think that the world has gone mad. Mm -hmm. You understand, we have this huge speculation in anything, in NFTs and in cryptos and in meme stocks and so forth. The less value something has, the more speculation there is. Mm -hmm. And gold and silver have been left out from the speculation. So I'm surprised that gold is, isn't at 3,000. I don't know. I think gold uh, is up 50 times from the time it was uh, in the 60s. So it's been, let's say, a good store of value. And I look at gold and silver as a good store of value. They have this year disappointed. They have been drifting down. And I suppose we are approaching a buying zone here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's somewhere around this level, maybe $50 lower for gold. Uh, maybe we've seen the low. But I wouldn't buy gold as a speculative asset. People should own gold because the, they know that the system is corrupt and not sustainable. Mm -hmm. The big question is not the price of gold. The big question is, will the corrupt socialist left-leaning parties allow you to keep your assets? Well, as Lenin said, the objective of socialism is communism. Wow. The objective is to take away private property. Uh, what you're seeing now in the economy, Dr. Faber, is it comparable to the Great Depression in the 1930s or is it, is it worse looking back at history? Well, in the 30s, we had these food lines and so forth. So it was quite bad for people that were unemployed. But to be fair, the economy came off very sharply into 1932, and then it bottomed out, and then it started to improve. Mm -hmm. Not hugely, but it started to improve. <coughs> and they introduced Social Security in 1933. And, and this I want to emphasize once again. In 1910, the US and European countries, they had government expenditures, overall, state, local, and federal, of less than 10% of GDP. We are now in most countries at between 40% and 60% of GDP. Mm -hmm. In other words, the government and I want to uh, emphasize this. The government is not the productive side of the economy. Some side of the government is productive, which is essentially being an arbiter, just creating the framework on, under which a free market can operate. But now the government interferes everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so it retards economic growth. And we have precise statistics already in the US that young people today at 35 years of age earn less than their parents did at the same age in real terms. Inflation adjusts. 
but the inflation adjusted according to figures by the Federal Reserve and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, not the real type of cost increases that has occurred. And number two, people at 35 years of age, they not only earn less than the parents did at the same age, they also have less assets than the parents at the same age in mm -hmm. real terms. This is the first generation that will live a lower standard of living than the parents. Mm -hmm. And this is why so many have become closet socialists in the sense that they say, well, the government should do this, the government should do that. Nobody ever says, I should do it. Yeah. I need to change my attitude. I have to go out and work and find a job. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's no sit at home. Oh, the government should do this, the government should do that. It's really sad watching it happen. I mean, I'm uh at an age where I remember the 1980s and the 1990s when there was a different attitude about all these things. And uh I mean, heck, like what you were saying about smoking earlier in the interview. I remember flying on airplanes when there were ashtrays on the armrest. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Ivan doesn't even know what that's about. But they, yeah, used, to, they, used, they used to be ashtrays right there on the armrest and airplanes and stuff. Well, but I want to tell you what has to, the consequence of not smoking anywhere is it's a the slippery slope. proliferation yeah. of nasty drugs like opioids. Yeah, because people can go into a bar, into a nightclub, into disco to get high. They don't drink anymore because if you drive and drink, you know, you know what happens. So they take pills. I mean, it's a crime against humanity that the FDA let opioid proliferate this way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, uh, a lot of the, the government. Uh, it's killing a lot of people. Uh, the, these, uh, you know, many more than COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, Dr. Faber, thank you very much for for giving us a half hour of your time. Well, we really I'm looking it. at your vault behind you, mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. I see a lot of gold bars. <laughs> so no silver you can bars. Send, <laughs> silver you can bars. Send one over. Yeah. Well, we yeah, look no, forward we to talking to you again in, in, in two or yes, three months. Sure. We appreciate uh I mean, as I said, I think the precious metals, they're probably in a buying range. There's no speculation in precious metals at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we need to wait for the fear trade to kick in? You know, there needs to be a no. you know a, a, the, the market just diving and everyone's really worried, then the fear trade will kick in for, for gold and silver. I think that may be a possibility. I know a lot of observers, they think this uh, recent weakness in stocks is a buying opportunity, mm -hmm. that the S&P by year end will be at 4,900. This is not my view. I think the market has been weakening for the last six months, but it's been hidden by the strengths in, say, three or four stocks that have driven the index up. So the index gives the impression that the market is going up, but the typical stock is down. Yeah, it's a very narrow, very narrow breadth. Of, very uh, narrow. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dr. Faber, thank you very much. And we'll talk to you again in two or three months, yes. sir. Sure. You have a good day, sir. Thank you. Yes.